Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, The Hulk. Comic book superheroes have thrilled and inspired generations of readers, while critics have dismissed them as nothing more than kid stuff. But if you go behind the mask and beneath the cape, you'll see a more complicated story. Ever since the Great Depression, superheroes have dealt with deep personal, social, and political issues. And in every era, the forces that have shaped our world have transformed theirs. Comic book superheroes unmasked. In 1938, the first and greatest superhero of them all, Superman, leaped from the pages of Action Comics number one into the imaginations of children everywhere. Faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Today, Superman has become a national icon, and that 10 cent comic could sell for over $300,000. But the Man of Steel nearly didn't get published. At first, only two people believed in him. His creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. In 1931, there were two 17-year-old kids from Cleveland, Ohio, who were obsessed with science fiction. Jerry Siegel wrote the stories, and his pal Joe Schuster illustrated them. The creations were never sold. Yet these poor Jewish kids dreamed that their sci-fi fantasies would someday bring them fame and fortune. In the 1930s, the big new trend in newspapers was the adventure comic strip. There was quality in the writing, there was quality in the drawing, there was just a general air of capital Q quality associated with newspaper comics. That's what Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster wanted for themselves. Siegel and Schuster's hero combined elements of everything they'd read, from comic strips to pulp magazines. He would be the last survivor of a dead planet, rocketed to Earth like a science fiction Moses, with the strength of Hercules fighting for the common man, Superman. Many years later, Jerry Siegel wrote about his inspiration. He recalled, I had crushes on girls who didn't care I existed, so it occurred to me, what if I was really terrific? Jumping over buildings or throwing cars around. Superman was sent to every newspaper syndicate in the country. They all said no. I wrote back to them and told them this very patronizing letter that they weren't ready for prime time, that they should stay in Cleveland for another year until they developed their art style, because the art was quite crude. So much for my great editorial judgment. Newspapers were saying no, but another newer medium held out some promise, comic books. Selling on newsstands for a dime, comic books were originally just reprints of newspaper strips. It was the cheapest way for newspaper publishers to put, repackage their comic strips. It was the video tape of its day. Then in 1935, Major Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, a pulp magazine writer turned comic publisher, had a revolutionary idea. Comic books with all new, never-before-published material. But to make his idea work, the material had to come cheap. The only people they could get to produce this content were guys that couldn't get work doing anything else because they were too young, or they were too inexperienced, or they were Jewish. Siegel and Schuster fit the bill. Wheeler Nicholson's company, soon to be called DC, gave the pair steady work. In 1938, the company, under new ownership, took a chance with the strip everyone had rejected. Siegel and Schuster, both 23, finally saw Superman published in the first issue of DC's Action Comics. Schuster cut up the panels, rearranged them in comic page form, and the golden age of comics began with the first issue of Action Comics. Imagine how amazing it would be to open up that first issue. I'll never have anything approaching the level of a sense of wonder that those first uh, kids that opened up Action Number no. 1 had way back in the day. The first stories were crude but direct. Unlike most newspaper heroes, Superman lived in the same world as his readers. This wasn't medieval England or another planet. This was a city, a metropolis of lynch mobs and wife beaters where politicians were crooks, where businessmen exploited workers and started wars in South America. 
It was the real world of 1938, a world in need of a hero. It was the spirit of the people. He was up against corrupt landlords and, 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 and vile dictators and, and, and bad generals and all that. The New Deal, of course, was an effort to try to redirect people to look to a powerful force, the federal government, to serve as their benefactor, uh, their protector against you know, local and greedy corrupt interests. Comic book superheroes were super new dealers, <laughs> like costume versions of Franklin Roosevelt. But what really made Superman revolutionary was his alter ego, Clark Kent. Kent made Superman accessible. And in turn, he needed to be Kent to be human, to have access to us. Superman comes from this other place to America. He can never go back there. It's been destroyed, very much as the Europe that, that especially the European Jews uh, left behind, was eventually destroyed. He is adopted by this ultimate American couple. He leaves behind the vaguely Hebraic-sounding Cal L and becomes Clark Kent, the ultimate American. Even if you don't look at him as an allegory of the immigrant, he is an immigrant. He did come to America, and he did make good. Superman's secret identity was an especially potent fantasy for the primary readers of comic books, boys. They were powerless like Clark Kent, but they dreamed that inside they were invincible heroes. Soon, it seemed like the whole country was caught up in the fantasy. There was a Superman radio show, along with motion picture cartoons, toys, and advertisements. His popularity in comic books even convinced a newspaper chain to turn him into a daily strip read by 20 million people. Meanwhile, each monthly issue of Action Comics with Superman sold nearly a million copies. Naturally, DC wanted another costumed character to match Superman's success. Bob Kane, a 22-year-old journeyman cartoonist, took up the challenge, along with 25-year-old writer Bill Finger. The Batman debuted in the 27th issue of Detective Comics. Unlike Superman, he had no superpowers, and there were other differences. While Superman fought for a liberal social agenda, the Batman fought crime, plain and simple. His story began when millionaire playboy Bruce Wayne, as a boy, witnessed the kind of street violence Depression-era readers knew all too well. He saw his parents killed, and now he's obsessed with uh, symbolically avenging those murders. It's perfect, and there's no way to elaborate. You say that, and you understand the character. Batman is a fascinating character, because he's so driven. Not the dude puts on, you know, the outfit with funny ears and the cape and he goes beats the crap out of criminals. It's his thought process that's behind it. Having the willpower to change his whole life and to balance being a spirit of vengeance and a spirit of justice, I think that's an immediately appealing concept. In the early stories, Batman was described as a weird figure of the dark, an avenger of evil, just as scary as any mobster, monster, or mad doctor. Readers loved him. DC now had two incredibly popular superheroes who were about to have a whole lot of company. Within a few years, there were dozens, uh, if not hundreds, of costumed superheroes uh, with all kinds of varying powers. With two very different superheroes raking in profits at the newsstands, it wasn't long before other publishers got into the comic book business. They knew what readers wanted. Crime fighters with catchy names. And most importantly, costumes. That was a lesson cartoonist Will Eisner learned when he was developing a detective hero. One night, he got a phone call from his publisher, Busy Arnold. I'm working the, the, on the drawing board and the phone rings and I could hear the jukebox going on. He was in a bar. He said, have you got a character yet? I said, yeah, I've got this guy, a detective. He said, yeah, but does he have a costume? So I'm sitting there, I was drawing the face and I drew a mask on him. I said, well, he's got a mask. He says, that's good, that's good. What else? I said, well, he wears gloves. Oh, he says, go with that. He says, that's good. <laughs> so anyway, that was how the spirit uh, got a costume. By 1940, Costumed superheroes were flooding the newsstands. At DC, Superman and Batman were joined by The Flash, Hawkman, Green Lantern, and more. Rival 